All right, how's everybody doing this morning? Yeah? Good. Um, <clears throat> hey, I want to, so we're in this series, Kingdom Story, and uh, one of my favorite family stories, I had to uh, call and talk to my mom to get some of the details to make sure that I have them right. Um, you know, sometimes when you have stories that are passed down in your family, it's sort of like it has less to do with the details of the story and it has more to do with the feeling that the story gives you. Um, so we have a picture, if you want to put that up there, Bridget. Um, it's a picture of my grandmother and my mother. Uh, that'll be coming up in a second. Uh, so here's the deal. My grandfather came over from, uh, from Denmark when he was three years old. He came over on a boat from Denmark. He immigrated. Um, and uh, he lived a pretty poor existence uh, and humble, humble means. And um, he lost his father at an early age, and he had to, he had to uh, work a ton to help support his family. He was one of a bunch of kids. Um, all through the Depression, uh, my grandma was in a, a different boat, but, you know, a different um, set of circumstances, but things weren't easy for anybody that was living in the Depression. Uh, so this is a picture of my grandma, and that's my mom uh, that's with her. Um, so my grandma, the story goes, my grandmother, during World War II, while my grandfather was overseas in World War II uh, in the Army, um, she was working at Snap-on Tools and working really, 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 really hard. And they were engaged, and uh, she just saved all of her money, just squirreled it away nonstop, didn't spend it on anything. She was always really, really frugal um, for all of her years. She was incredibly frugal. Um, so she saved up all this money, um, and when my uh, grandpa got back and they were uh, close to getting married, um, I don't know if it was the hopefulness of the, of the times that it seemed like it was, things were turning a corner and, you know, the war was over and it seemed like people were coming out of the depression and all that stuff, but my grandma uh, splurged on the coat that she's wearing, that fur coat that she's wearing. My mom says that this is like the one time that my grandmother ever splurged on anything, that she pinched her pennies up until that point and she pinched her pennies every day after that point, uh, but she splurged on this really, really nice fur coat so that when she would go out, she felt like a million bucks. It was like her one thing that she did. And so I heard stories as a kid of my grandma and grandpa in their early humble beginnings after the Depression, after World War II, they would go out in the town and my grandpa was ecstatic for her to have this, for her to have something uh, really, really nice. And she treasured that coat. My mom says that she remembers, um, you know, back in the day, you didn't like you didn't have a remote start on your car living in Wisconsin and cars were cold when you were driving around them and she remembers actually curling up in her like with her mom in the fur coat and being so warm while she was in the car when they were traveling different places um, so I have these like pictures of them going out in the town and she's wearing this fur coat and it's like this treasured possession that she has as they're starting this new phase of their life and they would go on to um, to be incredibly wise with their finances and to try to set their children and their grandchildren up uh, because of their hard work. And so I just, I always had this like, this picture of my grandma and grandpa, super cute, super young, uh, out on the town uh, with my grandma feeling like a million bucks because she worked really, really hard and was able to, uh, to, to splurge on something. You know, we, we love a good story. We love, we love stories like that of people triumphing over difficult circumstances, of things that make you feel good. Like there's something in us that leans into those stories. And in this series, we're, we're exploring just that idea that we're, like the reason why we lean into that, the reason why those get us in the feels sometimes, and for me it gets me in the feels because it's my family, um, but the reason why that is is because we were created to be a part of a story that's bigger than ourselves. We are Actually, whether we realize it or not, we are wrapped up in God's story, his kingdom story, and it plays out all around us. And so we are digging into what his kingdom story is all about, and we're digging into the fact that we are called to not only realize, like have our own hearts and minds uh, open up to the fact that we're a part of God's kingdom story, but we're also called to transmit that reality to other people, to give that away to other people, to help them see where they fit in the story of God, because that's what the world is craving, whether they realize it or not. It's what they're longing for. There is a search for something deeper, something more meaningful. Uh, and so we've been discussing with this role that we have in God's story, that every single one of us is called to not only be a follower of Jesus, but to follow Jesus means that we make other followers of Jesus. If we're going to be disciples, it means we make disciples. That's what it means to follow him. And so we've been talking about, well, to help people become followers of Jesus, to step into that responsibility, we have to understand the kingdom story. We have to be able to understand God's word and, be, and to be able to uh, explain that, to teach that, to give away that way of life. And so we're digging in over the next handful of weeks 
into sort of just like the, the meta-narrative, the 30,000-foot view of, of God's kingdom story and how, like, who that, what it says about him, what it says about us as human beings, how we fit in that story, and how we're to share that story with other people. And so this is the first week that we're kind of, um, we're going to just sort of hit high points within the story of God all through the narrative of Scripture so that we all understand um, we can locate ourselves within the context of God's story. So this first week, um, we're, we're diving in and we're starting at the very beginning. Um, and so we have to cover a lot of ground in this whole series, but this morning especially we have to cover a whole lot of ground. Uh, so there's a great resource called the Bible Project. Uh, they've got great informational and instructive videos on all kinds of different aspects. We'll probably use a couple of their different videos throughout this series. Uh, but I actually wanted to use one of their teaching videos in the first couple minutes here. It's about a five minute long video uh, to kind of set up the, the, the story, the beginning part of the story that we find in the book of Genesis. And then we're going we're gonna to dig in a little bit deeper into some of the specific themes. So um, are we ready to, to roll that video in the back? Yes? Okay, sweet. The Bible is a book you've probably heard of. It's called Genesis. Genesis comes from a Hebrew word. Uh, it's pronounced reshit, uh, and it just means beginning. Now, there's a lot of stories from the book of Genesis, and it's easy just to pull out a specific story and, and try to tell you what it might mean. But we think the best way to understand this book is to look at the book as a whole and show you how the whole thing is designed. The book is designed to fall into two main parts. You have uh, chapters 1 through 11, which is telling the story of God and the whole world. And then you have the second part, which is about God and Abraham's family, as chapters 12 through 50. And how the two of those parts relate, that's where you find the message of the book. Okay, so let's start back at the beginning. The first part of Genesis begins with a creation story, where God creates everything. And how exactly that happens, of course, that's where all the debates come. But he takes a dark, watery, chaos and he turns it into a beautiful garden where humans can can flourish that sounds nice it does sound nice in fact seven different times god says of all that he's made that it's good and this is where we meet the first human characters in the bible adam and eve they're they're both individual characters but they're also representative adam is the hebrew word for humanity and eve is the hebrew word for life and God creates them in his image. In other words, humanity reflects or is meant to reflect the, the, the creativity, the goodness and character of the creator out into the world that he's made. And they're supposed to reproduce and make cultures and neighborhoods and art and gardens and, and everything else. But he gives them a, a moral choice about how they're going to go about building this world. And this is what the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is all about. And he tells them, don't eat of the fruit of this tree or you will die. What's that all about? So up till now, God has been the one defining and providing what is good. And so God is the one with the knowledge of good and evil. But now this tree represents a choice. Will the humans trust God's definition of good and evil? Or are they going to seize the opportunity and define good and evil for themselves? And Adam and Eve eat the fruit. This is the core biblical explanation for that concept of sin, that desire to call the shots myself. It's the inward turn of the human heart to do what's good for me and my tribe, even if it's at the expense of you and, and your tribe. And the problem is humans are horrible at defining good and evil without God. And so now that humanity's made this choice, things get really, really, they're really bad. So Genesis 3, through 11 is like tracing this downward spiral of all, all humanity. So Adam and Eve, they can't trust each other anymore. And so there's a little story about how they were naked and felt fine about it beforehand, but now they feel shameful because all of a sudden Adam's definition of good and evil might be different than Eve's, and so they hide from each other. Then there's another story of temptation. Cain is jealous of his brother Abel, and he gives in and kills him. There's a story right after Cain about a guy named Lamech, and all we know about Lamech is that he accumulates wives like property, and he sings songs about how he's a more violent, vengeful person than Cain ever was, and he's proud of it. Things get so bad with the human race that we see God decide to just wipe us out. Yeah, we typically think of the flood story is about God being angry, but it actually begins with God's sadness and grief 
about the state of his world. And so out of his passion to preserve the goodness of his world, he washes it clean with the flood. But there's a glimmer of hope. He, he chooses Noah and his whole family, and he saves them on this boat. Yeah, don't forget about the animals. Right, and the animals. So Noah and his family are going to reboot all of humanity. I mean, he must be a pretty great guy. But this is the story most people don't know because it's kind of weird, is that Noah gets off the boat and he plants a vineyard and he gets totally plastered. And then something sketchy happens in his tent with his son. It's a tragic story. So from here, humanity grows again. But things are as bad as before. And the last story is the famous story of the Tower of Babel. And in this story, you have all of the nations uniting together to use this new technology they have, the brick. And they want to make a name for themselves and build this big city with a huge tower that will reach up to the gods. But God knows that this city will be a nightmare. And so in his mercy, he scatters them. And all of these stories, they're underlining the same basic idea. When humans seize autonomy from God, when they define good and evil for themselves, it results in a world of tragedy and death. And this leaves you wondering, is there any hope for humanity? Yes, yeah, there is. It's the very next story that answers that question. It's the beginning of God's mission to rescue and restore his world. All right, so there's a good summary of the first 11 chapters of, uh, of Genesis, and we'll, we'll be getting into the second part of Genesis next week. But um, I want to dig into, uh, and hopefully that, that gives some understanding. You know, we really, we're approaching this from this idea that um, we best understand the Word of God when we understand the overarching story that is the Word of God. We best understand who God is, and we best understand who we are, and we best, even, even the verses that we struggle with to make sense of them, we best understand those uh, specific uh, issues or those specific ideas when we locate them in the context of the grander story of God. And that's one of the reasons why I like the Bible Project, because they approach um, God's Word from that kind of a perspective, that kind of approach. So, um, so this morning, I want to I get into specifically... Um, Genesis and the, the creation narrative and the, uh, so Genesis 1 and 2 and, and uh, chapter 3, a little bit of chapter 3 as well. Um, but this is incredibly complex. So even Genesis 1, I love actually one of the things that Martin Luther, um, you know, the uh, Protestant theologian, what he said in his study of scripture, what he said about uh, Genesis chapter 1, he just acknowledged the complexity. He acknowledged the, the nuance and he acknowledged the importance of that's, that's held in Genesis 1. And this is what he says about uh, Genesis 1. He's like, basically, there's a lot going on there. There's a lot of different ways to look at it. Um, and then he settles on basically the only thing that we can be sure of in this chapter is, and this is his quote, that the world began and was made of God out of nothing. Like that's his, that's his takeaway from Genesis 1. It's like, listen, there's a lot of stuff you could look at and there's a lot of things that you can dig into, the, but, but, but the bottom line is the world began, was made of God out of nothing. And little did he realize that just a few hundred years later, even those, uh, those premises would be challenged by our culture and by our society, right? Um, so what I want to do is I, wanna, I want us to take a look at this, but I want to approach this in humility um, and so there's a lot of different ways that lots of godly people who hold the scriptures with like high regard, high esteem, high value that interpret things differently, okay? So it's Genesis chapter 1 verse 1. Now I want to just kind of hone in on what I think we need to, the, the main takeaways that we need to get. Um, and it's not that we can't study a lot of the other nuance or a lot of the specifics, um, but I want to just focus on, on keeping the main thing the main thing, basically. So uh, Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And what we have going on here that we have to remember is that um, this is, we've said this before and you've probably heard this, this is a pretty common saying, that the, the scripture, the word of God, was not written to us as central Wisconsinites um, in 2020. It wasn't written to us, but it was written for us. So what we read in the scriptures, it, they are ancient texts that are written to ancient people who are a part of ancient cultures. Now, it, 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 um, 
it supersedes and goes beyond. It's not like these, this truth was written only for ancient cultures and ancient people, but the context that was written in, it matters how we should be understanding what we're reading. Does that make sense? So it's, it's for us 100%. The scripture is for us. God knew what he was doing when he inspired the writers of scripture by the Holy Spirit to write down what they wrote down. He knew what he was doing. He knew that we would be thumbing through them thousands of years later. And he knew that he was going to write them in a way that would meet us right where we're at. But they weren't written to us, right? They were written to an ancient culture. And so we have to understand that. Ancient cultures, this is true across the board. And this is a problem. Like we have this tendency to sort of think that like everybody thinks the way that we think. That's called ethnocentric, uh, an ethnocentric view of, of the world, like, so we have a tendency as central Wisconsinites to think that everybody either does think like us or they should think like us, right? And so, you know, people on the coast, on the left coast and on the right coast, like they just need to figure it out and they should think the way that we think because we're smarter and we understand better how to do life than people that are on the coast, right? And we have this, and it, and it happens through, through time as well. So like we have this tendency to think that either... Um, Everyone in ancient cultures, they already prioritized and thought the way that we think, or they should have. We're more advanced and we understand things better than they understand. And so if they didn't, they should. That's, that's, that's a wrong way of looking at things, okay? Um, we can grow and advance with technology and with understanding of the world, um, but sometimes there are some things that ancient cultures understood better than we did. So ancient cultures were almost never concerned with the how, they were concerned with the who and the why. And so when we look at this creation narrative, or we look at Genesis 1-1, this is incredibly vague. They don't get into the how God did this at all. And there is somehow in the future verses of Genesis 1 and some of uh, Genesis chapter 2. But honestly, like if you're looking for this to be a scientific document that you're going to like line up with current modern science and make sure that everything's congruent, you're not going to find everything that you need. It's not going to be there, right? They were very much less concerned with how. They were mostly concerned with who and why, uh, which is ironic in my mind because we're so obsessed with the how in our culture, we want everything to be uh, imperially understood. We want to use the scientific method to understand everything. Like we can parse it all out and we can understand the how. But really when you get down to so many of the debates within the church and even outside of the church, it comes down to what people are wrestling with is the who and the why. They're wrestling with what is the purpose behind existence? What is who's behind existence. What, what are we dealing with here, right? And so we want to get obsessed with the how, but the ancient writers were obsessed with the who and the why. And so what is being laid out here in Genesis 1-1 very clearly, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Um, we are being told uh, who the creator is. The creator is being identified, that there is a creator, that everything comes from. It's explaining the origin of the world. So the creator is being identified and the origin of the world is being explained not in the terms that our modern culture wants it to be defined in, but being defined in terms that in an ancient culture, this would have scratched the itch, right? So much so to where we, we find in like later in scripture, the other writers in scripture, you can see how they interpret the beginning of Genesis, the beginning of the word of God, they are interpreting it this way, that this is what's most important. What you see in this, uh, there's an author, his name is Dr. John Salehammer, and he wrote a book called Genesis Unbound, which is a kind of a different way of looking at Genesis that um, is really intriguing, really interesting. He says this, that God's work of creation, he's talking about <clears throat> within other places in scripture, God's work of creation is always the Bible's final ground of appeal in establishing God's power and deity. And so all throughout the scripture, the testimony of scripture, it comes back to over and over again the fact that God is the creator, right? He is the one who created everything, and we can understand the origin of the world by understanding him. And that the fact that he's the creator and he's the origin of the world 
um, that it, it gives meaning to who he is and it gives meaning to our interaction with him. So let me give you a couple of scriptural examples that kind of explain this. So Jeremiah chapter 10, he's giving instruction to the nation of Israel as they're being carried off into exile. And he says this, tell them this, you're going into foreign lands where they don't believe in your God. They don't believe in the, the creator God. Tell them this, these gods, lowercase g, idols that you serve, these gods who did not make the heavens and the earth will perish from the earth and from under the heavens. God's role as creator, his role in the origin of the created universe is central to the understanding of who God is. That's a core tenet. Here's another one, Psalm 96.5. It says, for, the writer of the psalm says, for all the gods of the nations are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Okay, so what we get to in Genesis 1-1 is that the core thing that we need to understand is that God is the creator. He is at the center of the origin of everything. And we don't get into a scientific explanation of exactly how that happens. And there's lots of different ways to look at it. I would actually, um, uh, there's a couple of great reads. If you're, if you're somebody who likes to nerd out on some of this stuff, there's a couple of great reads that I would highly recommend. Uh, one of them is by that author, uh, Dr. John Salehammer. Uh, it's called Genesis Unbound. Really great read. Um, if you want to sort of just like step back and look at scripture in a totally different way than you've looked before. And these are, these are not like, crackpot people who are off in left field and they have a blog about it, okay? This is, he is a respected biblical Old Testament scholar. Um, his work is highly respected by, by other scholars. Uh, there's another one uh, by John H. Walton called The Lost World of Genesis 1. Um, really interesting read. Both of these reads, um, I read them, so they are accessible to anybody. Like, I do not have a big brain. I, things that are, like, deep, I have to read them many, many times to understand them. Um, so I would say, if you're interested at all, um, dig into either of those books, Genesis Unbound or The Lost World of Genesis 1. They're, they're really interesting uh, reads. So what we get here in Genesis 1-1 is an introduction to the most important character, to the main character of the kingdom story. We get an introduction to God. And it is interesting to note that in this entire first chapter, God is the only character. It's him. That's it. The writers were making clear that this is a story, this kingdom story. Human beings are a part of this kingdom story. Human beings are not the star of this story. God is the star of the story, right? So that's being laid out. <clears throat> He's the only character. There, are, Like we've said, there are lots of questions that are left unanswered for us. And the author doesn't pause to get into all of those things. He doesn't even pause to get into all of the theology and philosophy of who God is. In fact, it's almost like there's this understanding that as, <clears throat> as the story of God unfolds, we will learn about who God is through the story. He doesn't lay out this, here are the bullet point character traits of who God is. Here's what you need to know about God. It's like, no, there's a story that's unfolding. And as it unfolds, you will begin to understand who God is. And you'll begin, you begin to understand who you are. So G, uh, Genesis teaches us about God simply by telling us what he did. He created. And in that creation, he is revealing himself. He's disclosing who he is to humanity to humankind. And we'll find out much more, but again, the story of God is going to drive our understanding of who he is. Now, I know when we get into this <clears throat> that we start talking about creation. Um, like, there are some people that are like, yeah, the Bible says it. I agree. Like, it's 100%. I take it. Seven-day literal creation. I can see how it happened. I've looked into young earth creationism. You can, like, you can dig into all that. And there are other people that are like, hold on a second, how does this jive with science. How does this work with scientific discovery? And again, I would say there are lots of um, genuine followers of Jesus with really good hearts that really elevate and value the Word of God that look at it differently. And we have to understand that and be okay with that, okay? Um, but uh, I, here's like, this is one of my favorite things, and I think I've done this in this space a couple of different times, but humor me. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it again. One of my favorite things to look at is um, like, I'm, I've always been intrigued by stars. Uh, true story, one time I thought it would be, I remember going to the planetarium when I was uh, young, and I thought it was amazing. 
And um, for some reason, like, I love the stars, and I forgot to ask my wife if she loves space, and she hates space. Um, but, you know, we're, like, obsessed with ourselves, and we just think about ourselves. And I thought, I'm going to take her on a really cool date. And so we went to the planetarium, and she hated it. And we were in there with a Girl Scout troop, and it was, um, it was, it was dumb. Uh, it was a fail. Uh, so I, like, I love space. It, this is really interesting to me. I just stumbled across recently um, that they are... Uh, a new planet has been discovered. The name of the new planet that has been discovered is K2-141b. It's great. It really, really hooks you in with that, right? Uh, but they discovered this planet, and this planet is, is shockingly horrible. Like, the environment of this planet is impossibly hostile towards life of any kind. This, uh, this planet... Um, it is on the, <clears throat> on the hot side of the planet, is 50, it's 5,400 degrees Fahrenheit, okay? That is hot enough to not only melt rocks, but it is hot enough to vaporize rocks. That is difficult for my brain to even understand. But like the solid of a rock can be not just liquefied into lava, but it can be, uh, that's, that's crazy. It can be vaporized. It can be turned into vapor. Well, we know how it works on our planet, right? Like you, you have, um, you know, you've uh, moisture and it turns into a vapor and what? It goes up into the air and then when it gets up into the air, it condenses. This is like science 101 taught by Jeff O'Connor. Uh, it condenses and then we end up with rain and it rains back down. Well, what happens is on the light side, the hot side of this planet, K2141b, uh, it, it, like rocks are actually being vaporized. But then they're moving at supersonic wind speeds, okay? So, like, the winds are crazy volatile on this planet. So now these rock vapors are actually being transported back towards the cool side of the planet, which the cool side of the planet is negative 328 degrees Fahrenheit. That's crazy, okay? So as this, these vaporized gaseous rocks are being blown back towards the cooler side of the planet, they're doing exactly what happens in our weather system. They're actually condensing. This is not scientifically approved, okay, but I'm just giving you my version of what I understood from the article I read, okay? Uh, they, are, they are condensing, and it actually causes rocks to rain down onto the planet. This is a planet where rocks rain down. So, like, I look at that, and I just go, man, like, Earth has not been that fun to live on in 2020, but I will take Earth over K2141b every single time, right? And if you struggle with the idea of creationism, if you struggle with how does this jive with science, this isn't an answer to you, but I will just say this. There is evidence of design all over the place. All over the place. So this idea that our planet is uh, it's inhabitable, like, it's actually a hospitable environment for human beings to live. Th those are called anthropic principles or anthropic constants. That means that this is what causes the earth to be able to sustain human life. And at any given moment, if any one of these wasn't happening, we wouldn't be able to live on earth. And there are, scientists are discovering new anthropic constants all the time. There's 120, I think it's grown probably since I last looked, but there's 120 of those anthropic constants. Let me just give you a couple of those that are my favorite ones, okay? The anthropic principle is just a fancy way of saying the universe is finely tuned to allow uh, for human life on earth. <clears throat> so number one, the oxygen level. Um, we need oxygen to survive as human beings. A slight increase in oxygen means that there would be spontaneous fire eruptions. A slight decrease would mean that we would suffocate and we wouldn't, you know, we're dead. Spontaneous fires or suffocation, we die. Uh, the earth is tilted on a 23.5 degree axis. That's the tilt to the earth, right? We know the earth isn't sitting straight up and down. There's a tilt in the way that it's spinning uh, as we are uh, going around the sun. Um, that tilt is just right. If the tilt of this planet were just a little bit off, it was altered slightly, surface temperatures would be too extreme on Earth. Jupiter. Like, I did not wake up this morning thankful for Jupiter, but I should have been thankful for Jupiter because if Jupiter wasn't the size that it is, and if it wasn't located in the orbit that it is located in within our solar system, so if it wasn't there, if it weren't in its current orbit, the Earth would be bombarded with space material. But as it stands right now, Jupiter actually acts as this giant magnet for space 
trash and just draws it all in so that our world isn't pelted constantly by debris from space. Uh, the last one that I'll get into is the rotation of the earth. The speed at which, like our 24-hour day, right? The 24-hour rotation of the earth on its axis. If it took longer than 24 hours, temperature differences would be too great between night and day. K2-141B, anyone, right? Okay. Um, <clears throat> They'd be too great between night and day if it was shorter, so if it spun faster, the atmospheric wind velocities would be too great. We wouldn't, like our weather systems wouldn't function, we wouldn't be able to function as human beings. So and this is just four, and there's well over 120 of these that are true, that our world, and if you just go, well, yeah, that's why there's human life, because this is the one planet that can sustain human life. So, um, I don't understand all this, but there are people who are good with numbers um, who took all of these supposed coincidences of these 120 plus anthropic constants occurring on one planet in the universe. So the, uh, the chance that all 120 plus of these would occur on one planet, because again, any one of those changes and we're dead. We don't get to live, right? The chance of that happening is one chance in, and we'll just put, that's the number, okay? That is, so I'll save you the counting, that's 138 zeros. The chances of that happening in one planet, all of those things, one in the number, the name of that is one quinquadragintillion. One in one quinquadragintillion. In essence, a 0% chance of that happening. So if you struggle with that, I would just say, again, I know I'm not giving you any answers as to the how, but we need to be realistic about the fact that there is, even though we may, whether we understand the how it happened or not, we have to understand that there, there's a very real case to be made for the who and the why. That it is God who creates and he is at the center of, of the story, and the universe originated with him. So in Genesis 1, we find that God is the only eternal one, because in the beginning there was nothing but him. So he is the eternal one. He created our world simply by speaking. He told land to form, and it obeyed. He called it into being. He called light into being, and it happened. Every single thing in our universe came into existence in obedience to God's command. Amen. Everything. Everything. This should lead for you and I to great humility. Great humility about our place in this world and in this story. As I've already said, we're not the center of the universe. God created this world and he graciously placed us in the midst of it. But all the authority and all the ownership, it's his. It belongs to him. But as we saw in our video, um, everything changed very quickly. So God creates humanity in the image of God. Genesis 1.26 says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God makes humanity in his image. And we find that humanity is absolutely unique. We are not God because we've been created just like everything else, but at the same time, we're not like everything else in creation because we are the only parts of creation that actually bear God's image. He created us to be like him, and he set us in the middle of his world to represent him in some way. Um, the image of God that that speaks of, or like, let us make man in our image, um, in the New Testament, Jesus is the image of the invisible God in Colossians 1.15. And in Hebrews 1.3, we're told that Jesus is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And so it seems that being made in the image of God has something to do with us reflecting God in some way to the world around us representing him to the world around us in some way. That was the intention. I love what theologian and author N.T. Wright says about this. He says, God created human beings uniquely. I'm paraphrasing, but he says that God created human beings uniquely to stand at the interface between God and all of creation. 
that we are the only um, beings that can articulate worship. And so it's our responsibility to gather up all the praise of all creation. Like the scriptures say that the rocks, like if we shut up about who God is, that the rocks will cry out. So that means that there is a role for us to articulate worship. But that is worship that's actually being declared by all of creation. That the heavens declare his glory. The rocks will cry out if we don't do it. And so we're sent in the middle of creation, reflecting God's image, to gather up all of the worship of all of creation and to articulate it back to God in praise. And then at the same time, to take God's wise and just rule and to establish his system and his order throughout creation. We see him doing that with Adam and Eve. He gives them roles and he gives them responsibilities in in administering his justice and his wisdom in the created world. We have this, this position in creation. Human beings, we were meant to stand as a reminder to the rest of the world that God is king and that it's his story that's being written that we're a part of. And we cannot miss this absolute perfection that we find in Genesis 1 and 2. It's absolute peace. It's absolute harmony. It's perfect beauty that's being described. That God would walk with Adam and Eve, with humanity in the cool of the evening, in the beauty of the Garden of Eden. There's beauty Humanity lives in perfect fellowship with God, each other, and with creation, but it all goes wrong. It all goes wrong. Genesis, like it takes a crazy turn. Genesis 3.1, we see, and again, this was, we saw this in the video, but we see that the enemy comes to steal and to kill and to destroy. And the enemy comes in, in the form of a serpent, and he whispers lies to Adam and Eve. And he says in Genesis 3, 1, did God really say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? He subtly, Satan subtly works to make Eve feel that God has deprived her of something. That in him, her needs are not fully met. Subtly, he's working this angle. And if you notice in this passage, if you've read it before, Did God really say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? Satan promises good things to her. The issue is that he promises good things to her, but life in the garden was already full of good things, enjoyed through the grace and the presence of God. Her life was already full of good things through the grace and the presence of God. So it's not just that Satan is is, um, promising her good things. He's promising her good things apart from God. That this whole idea of Genesis 1-1, in the beginning God created. He is the creator and he is the origin of the universe, which means he has all authority, he has all ownership, it's all his, he's the king, it's his story, that's being challenged immediately. It's being challenged immediately. He promises her good things apart from God, he gives them an opportunity to be in charge, to decide for themselves the difference between good and evil giving them the option of thinking that, hey, it doesn't have to be God that's on the throne. You can actually be on the throne. You can be in charge. You can decide what good and evil is. And so this is what we have to learn from from this, that sin, no matter what form it takes on, sin is always a declaration of autonomy. It's always a declaration of, I can do things my way. I'm in charge. It's my life. I'm going to do it how I want, regardless of what God thinks, regardless of what it does to another human being. Sin is always a declaration of of autonomy. And immediately when Adam and Eve took the fruit and they ate it, sin entered the world and the world became a different place. And we see everything turn on its head. People find themselves separated from God, each other, and creation. Adam and Eve, they happily existed in creation up until that point, but now pain and childbearing and curse on the ground that they would be working would enter into the equation, everything would change. That There would be toil now in the work that they had once enjoyed. But the greatest consequence was death. Spiritual death that would occur immediately and a physical death that would follow. 
in the spiritual death's footsteps. Now, if we've heard this a lot, if you're a Christian, you've grown up in church, or you've been around for a long, long time, we are in danger of being anesthetized, numbed to the power of what's just occurred in this story, to just how tragic this was. I want you to think about this. They had experienced a perfect human relationship. None of us can even imagine that. None of us. Now, I know you would assume that my relationship with Carrie is perfect because it's me, guys, you know. Um, But I'm going to just burst that bubble for you. There's none of us in this room that have experienced a perfect relationship. All of us have been damaged and wounded by people in varying degrees, but like we've not, imagine experiencing perfection in a human relationship. Imagine the the depth of intimacy, not only with another human being, but imagine the depth of intimacy with the God who created you, the all-powerful God who is the hero of the story. Imagine that access that they had to him. Imagine how beautiful that would have been. This is so far from our reality that sometimes it feels like it's not even imaginable, like it's hard for us to even wrap our minds around. And they lost all of this. And the reason they lost all this to us, it feels like it's, like when we just look at it on the surface, it feels like it's so harmless. Like they just ate some fruit. It's not that big of a deal. But the reality of it is, is that the first sin was rebellion. The first sin was rebellion, idolatry, Treason and pride all rolled into one single bite. That bite of the fruit was just an outward act that represented something else that resided inside them and resides in us that's far more sinister. And so, like, humanity's ability to accurately represent God, to gather up creation's praise and articulate it and take God's justice and his wisdom and administer it to the world around us, all of a sudden that's in question. Can we actually do what we were created to do? And it's not really just that it's in question, it's kind of being shown that we can't. We can't do it. And God would have been in completely fair, you would have been completely fair and loving to end everything right then. But he was grieved And so we're only 11 chapters in, less than 1% of the total scripture, story of God, and we're already starting to see a theme of scripture, that people sin, people face consequences, God redeems. And so this is setting the stage for this epic story. This is a part of the epic story. It's setting a stage for where now we were really, first of all, the first part of God revealing his character is that he's all-powerful and has all authority. He can do whatever he wants. He's in charge. And now we see more of his character is going to be unpacked in that he is a loving and a patient God, even as he is a just God. And he will begin the process of redeeming his creation. So what do we do with that? What do we, what do, we do, to do with this in closing? This idea that in the beginning, God created the heavens, establishing him over everything as the author, the hero of the story. I want to read you um, a passage of scripture from Isaiah that's really powerful. And I want you to notice It's going to declare the power and the authority and the majesty of God in his creation, okay? It lays it out in no uncertain terms. And again, it doesn't get into how, but it does get into the who, and it does get into the why, right? Lays out God's position as the author and the creator. And at the very end of the passage, you're going to hear it turns a corner and starts talking about what that means for you and me. The fact that he's all-powerful The fact that he spoke the world into the existence, what does that mean for you and I in the way that we interact for him? So that's a longer passage. I want to read it to you. The words will be on the screen. Isaiah 40, and it's a a selection of verses. It says, Who else has held the oceans in his hand? Who has measured off the heavens with his fingers? Who else knows the weight of the earth or has weighed the mountains and hills on a scale? Who is able to advise the Spirit of the Lord? Who knows enough to give him advice or teach him? Has the Lord ever needed anyone's advice? 
Does he need instruction about what is good? Did someone teach him what is right or show him the path of justice? No. For all the nations of the world are but a drop in the bucket. They are nothing more than dust on the scales. He picks up the whole earth as though it were a grain of sand. To whom will you compare me? Who is my equal? Asks the Holy One. Look up into the heavens. Who created the stars? He brings them out like an army, one after another, calling each by its name. Because of his great power and incomparable strength, not a single one is missing. O Jacob, how can you say the Lord does not see your troubles? O Israel, how can you say your God ignores your rights? Have you never heard? Have you never understood? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of all the earth. He never grows weak or weary. No one can measure the depths of his understanding. He gives power to the weak and strength to the powerless. Even youths will become weak and tired and young men will fall in exhaustion. But those who trust in the Lord will find new strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. This all-powerful, mighty creator bends from his high position to you and to me. And he offers all of his power and he offers all of his authority to set all things right in our life. To restore our relationship with him. To begin the process of restoring our relationship with other human beings and restoring our relationship with broken creation. He extends all of this to us. The question for us is if we are accepting of that. For acknowledging who he is. So let's go before him in prayer. Let's acknowledge his goodness. Let's ask for him to meet us where we're at. Lord, we come before you this morning recognizing that you are all powerful. In the beginning, you created And we declare that you are eternal, you are holy, you are completely other than anything else in all of creation. We stand humbled and in awe by you. God, we ask that you would breathe your life and breathe your strength and breathe your hope into us as we seek to trust in you. God, would you give us endurance Would you give us hope? Would you give us trust and peace in the process, God? We look to you. Help us to find our place in your story. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. I want to thank you for being a part of uh, our service this morning. Again, whether you, you made the trek to be here in person or whether you're joining us online, we're so glad that you're a part of of what's going on here. Um, I hope that you have a great rest of your day and hopefully we'll see you back here next week.